Now, uh, welcome back, everyone, and I want to welcome Mr. Chris Rowe of Rose Holdings. So for the Hansard record, if you could please give your name and the capacity in which you appear today. Yeah, my name's Chris Rowe. Um, I'm from Rose Holdings. We're a, a very, very small family-owned uh, transport company. Um, we've got a, a family history in, in the road transport industry. My father, myself, and my son have all uh, spent our entire working lives in the industry. And, um, yeah, so I'd uh, like to give you whatever I can from that. You can, thank you. And I'm going to be uh, very uh, informal and refer to Mr Rowe as Chris because we've been working please, together for, please. for uh, over 12 months now as most of the witnesses. So, Chris, thanks very much, mate. Now, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make an opening statement. Normally we say brief, but I don't want you to be brief, Chris. I want you to actually lay it all on the line and tell us, the committee, and all those listening out there, um, what you think we need to hear. Not only that, mate, you've been around a long time. We're very good in this industry of coming up with all the problems, but we're seeking solutions. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad that that's what we are doing, is seeking solutions. Um, Mike, I, I think one of the biggest problems as an industry that we have, and uh, I, I want to go back, I, I probably tend sometimes to look at the whole history of the industry, but I worry that over the history of our industry, we've um, kidded ourselves a lot. We've um, we've um, thought and pretended that we were doing the right thing. We thought that we were doing okay, um, and in in reality, I don't know that we ever did. Um, um, over the years, you know, there was um, things like you know there were various taxes over the years and as an industry we became very good at getting around things. We got around the road tax industry, uh, the road tax um, uh, issue when it was there. Um, the industry's always been very good at that. Um, you know, for years, you know, we um, got around our logbook issues before the before current things. You know, we've done all, all these sort of things over the years to survive. None of it was to do anything other than survive, but these are the sort of things that we've done over the years, and yet no one's ever been game enough to put their hand up and say, you know, things aren't real good here, you know, like, like um, all we've done is convinced others, we've convinced the, the um, convinced a lot of people that we've been doing the right thing, when we simply haven't, we, we may well have been doing the right thing, but we haven't been able to obey every piece of legislation to the letter of the law, simply as, as that. So rather than be proactive and go and seek help to change those sort of things, all we've seek to do is get around them. And um, until we actually understand that and, and, and appreciate it, then we can't do other things that, that you know. Um, I'm convinced that um, while the rates issues and, and, and payments to drivers and everything won't, you know, it simply won't stop every every accident. But the same token to suggest that um, the, the payments to drivers and rates to subcontractors and all those sort of things have no influence on safety is a total crock up, I might you, you know. Can like, um, language you like, Chris. And, 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 um, and, and it is, you know, because... There are so many instances where, and again, we kid ourselves that, that we're doing everything right. And, um, you know, just just in the week that I've just currently endured, well, well not endured is probably not the right word, but um, uh, the, I, I've been communicating with Sarah that I desperately wanted to be here today and that my original plan was to be here at 8 o'clock this morning. I managed to get here by about um, 11, 11.30 or something, you know. Just due to invariables that happen during the week uh, in, in the normal life of a truck driver, and it is just, we write it off as being just trucking. But um, there were things that happened beyond our scope and beyond our control and beyond my scope and control during the week, which got me here at this stage of the day. Um, I was just, just speaking to um, Gordon McKinley outside and said to him, it doesn't matter much to me today because um, I'd always intended to be here. In the normal course of events, today would be a lost day over things that have happened during the course of the week. So 20% of my productivity is gone. 
for the week because I wouldn't have got into Melbourne at this stage of the day to unload and reload and, and, and yeah, come yeah. again, you know. Mm. So then I'm faced with next week, <clears throat> how do I recover that? And, and you know, when these things go on and on and on and, and uh, are allowed to happen all the time, um, well, that, without any scope for, for recovery, unfortunately, at our thing, you tend to look at other ways that you can recover. And um, we've been told by some of the associations that have been held in on the safety thing that the chain of responsibility will cover all the all the safety concerns that the industry have. Now, you know, I, I find that a bit of a joke, to be quite honest, too, because um, <clears throat> if I, I'll tell you straight out, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm totally aware of chain of responsibility and its and its um, effect it can have on us all. Um, you know, I'm scared of a, a, an interaction with any of the road authorities going wrong, so we try as hard as we possibly can to do things as well as we possibly can. Um, but there's only one person scares me, well, two people perhaps, but one person scares me more than the... Um, the, uh, the the road authorities, the, the RMSs, the police task force and all that sort of thing, and that's the bank manager. Because, you know, if, if I do something wrong with, you know, uh, the, one of the authorities get onto me and I've done something wrong, or well, somewhere down the track I'll pay a penalty for that. If I haven't got the money in the bank to pay the fuel bill on yesterday um, or the truck payment whenever it's due, then I'm in trouble straight away. Can I just chip in there? Yep. Chris? Sorry, mate, for those listening outside. When you say doing something wrong by the authorities, we're not talking criminals. We're not oh. talking drug runners. We're talking a spelling mistake or a piece of paperwork. I yeah, just want yeah, you to or, explain or, something. Or, with or, that. or to have worked half an hour more than what I should have done, or or, um, yeah. or uh, you know anything like that, Glenn. You know, they're, they're, or, or you know, had half a ton on more than what I should have done, you know, like uh, just to recover, try and recover the, uh, the the things that you do, you know. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's where I'm sort of coming from. And I'm, I'm just... <sighs> at, at one of the, one of our, um, those meetings in Canberra, last one in Canberra, Hugh McMaster from RDO yeah. was there, and Hugh came up with a thing um, that, uh, on the chain of responsibility thing, he, and, and I just think it's the best thing I'd ever heard. He said... We need to have an economic chain of responsibility. And, and, and I don't think that's a top idea because it needs to be driven from the top down rather than from the bottom up. You know, like, like if there was an economic chain of responsibility where we could recover those things that happen to you during the, the course of a working week, um, uh, you know, if it's a hold up at a, at a DC that you can actually charge for that time, um, all those sort of things would, would, would make a hell of a difference, you know, but it has to be driven from the top down. Um, I've often heard it said that, um, I've often heard it said that, you know, we're a market industry and, and, and that you've got to play the market and, um, and uh, you know, free markets should flourish and all that, and that's, that's all fine, you know. Um, but I often come up with an, I, I used to come up with an analogy that, um, like, like, I'll just backtrack a bit. Um, when, when we when we're talking free market, I've I've often had people say to me, "Look, if there's somebody out there willing to do it for that price, then then you know how can the major companies not take that price on?" And the analogy I use is if you've got somebody, if, if later on tonight, Glenn, we're having a beer, and somebody comes up to us and taps us on the shoulder and says, "Mate, out in the back of my Ute, I've got a box with a colour TV in it." And I can let you have that for 100 bucks or whatever. And we say, yeah, good. You know, like that's a top deal, that is. I'll grab that. Bloody, uh, you know, exactly. So when yeah. some, when man comes around knocking on your door, because you should have known. Now, I use the same analogy when we come to rates for subcontractors and that sort of thing. The fact that, the fact yeah. that somebody is willing to do it for that doesn't mean that it's right. You know, like, I mean, the pe people at the top must know that somebody down here is doing something, cutting a corner somewhere or other, to do it, you know? So if it's not legal for the bloke, if, if it's not legal to take the TV off that bloke, it ain't legal to accept the bloody uh, service off it either, you know? I couldn't have put it better myself. So that's right. that's where I'm coming from, Lynn, that, that um, you know, I'm convinced over the years that, that um, 
that uh, we've undersold ourselves. And then, and look, that's that's a thing from certainly all of us. We under, we sell ourselves far too cheap. Um, we undersell ourselves over the whole industry. You know, I don't care who it is, whether from the major companies to the subcontractors to the drivers, we undersell ourselves far too much, you know. And again, uh, we talk about what it might cost. Um, the, co the, the, the cost would divide it down is very minimal. Um, I, I can only use the analogies that I, that I know and I'm aware of. We used to do a little job out of my hometown out of Jarrell recording uh, produce to the Sydney markets and um, and it was uh, onions and potatoes and things like that that were, that were sold in the Sydney markets and while the grower was always more than cooperative to try and help you with better rates, the, the market uh, agents that were paying the freight always kept you screwed down. And we suggested to them at one stage, if we could have got an extra $240 between Jarulli and Sydney, that would have been really, really, that would have been a really big, big help to us, you know. And we were constantly told that's simply not possible, you know, like, buddy, uh, you know, we'd never be able to sell a product. Now, that product was, on a load, was 24 tonnes of onions. 24 tonnes is 24,000 kilos. To get $240 extra, it would add one cent to the cost of the product in the shop. There you go. Yeah. That's my banana yeah, argument. Exactly. You know, like, and, and, yeah. and, you know, you can do the same analogy with a, a, a B double load of Coca Cola. Mm. You know, the, the actual cost is, is minimal. You know, like, it's not going to affect the market at all. Chris, can I come in here? Yep. And, and I read your submission. I've read all your articles that come out and I can't, I can't fault any of them, but I'll tell you what, we are ready for another Razorback anyway. I wouldn't be irresponsible for me to suggest that I'll be at the front with you if that does happen. But let's go back to where you touched on in your opening statement as well, where you've talked about the myriad of instances where we have sought to get around legislation and regulation and then pass on, you know, rather than pass on the, 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 the true cost to our customers. Someone listening in who's not from a trucking background could think, well, hang on, what's different now than what... Why are, why are you only whinging and complaining? Not you. Why is the industry only whinging and complaining now? I'd be interested to know what's changed from the way when we used... And, mate, me being an ex-truck driver, I reckon I had every excuse why I had to do the, something that wasn't kosher. I've never hidden from the fact that was deemed modus operandi was... Mm -hmm. You were encouraged, you were rewarded mm -hmm. for circumventing certain things. That's right. That's and I right. don't come clean of hands because the, we The difference is now, obviously, that that that, um, that um, the world's moved on. We've, we've been caught up with. You know, there's no scope anymore to do those sort of things. So, in in from that instance in itself, but he. Um, you, and you can use your trucking uh, terminology because I'm fluent in truck speak <laughs> or trucking speak. There's, so there's, there there's, there's no scope anymore to, to, to overload the cheap. You know, the camera system's got you um, doing the right thing by your hours recording, um, and uh, oh, you know all, all that sort of thing. It, and, and it has, but don't underestimate still <clears> the <throat> ability of a driver and or owner driver stuck in a corner to be able to come up with something that um, that will circumvent that still. And like the now. old, my, my favourite line of the old Wild West before we were regulated for driving hours, everything was legal until we got caught. Exactly. So what we are saying, Chris, I, I don't know, and you and everyone, and you're, you're one of the leaders in the industry, it doesn't make it right. No, 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 it no, 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 it's it not right. right at all. Yeah, so, and I'm very keen because you've gone, you've addressed... Uh, every point of the terms of reference, and I think it's very important that, and I've made this very clear from day one, I want to hear from those that have had their hands on the steering wheel, currently or previously, as much as I want to hear from the employers, because this is an issue that is not the subby versus the uh, freight forwarder, this is not the driver versus the boss, this is an industry that is getting the living dollars belted out of it by the top of the economic supply chain, and you've given me a brand new line, I'd like to I'd like to say I invented myself, but we're on the public record. I can't now. You own it. The economic chain of responsibility. So no, that's you, McMaster's. I don't know. Oh, that was you. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. So, so Chris, and let's just keep working our way through because I'm finding, you know, the more if you want something done properly, you go to the people that do it. If you want something fixed, you go to the people that do it. And I think this is a golden opportunity for the transport workers, the drivers and, and of this nation, to actually put it all out on the record to help us form a report that I will present to government as the chair of the committee, and hopefully we have a joint agreement that we all agree to go forward. 
What do we need to do to fix this now, mate? To fix the... To fix the industry so we're viable, sustainable, safe, and God help us, we're profitable. Yeah. yeah. Now, this, seem, this may seem easy, and we could go for days talking about this. Yeah. Um, to, 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 to fix the viability, we... Uh, well, for, for a start, um, we've got to probably start, you know, and work our way through... It's, it's absolutely essential that for a start that there's some legislation to, well, the legislation's already there, that, that, that there's some means, and if, and if it means cranking up our, our uh, authorities like the Fair Work Ombudsman or whatever, to make sure that whatever the award for a driver is, that the driver's paid that award. That way, then at least then we can move into the next part of it with between... Um, the marketplace where, where, where you've got owner drivers and that if, if, if the, if the driver's being paid a fair reward and it's being enforced that he's actually getting everything that he's entitled to, then all of a sudden the, the, um, there's more scope there to pay more money to your owner operator who, that the, the rate will, will come up then to cover that. Um, so, so that's probably where it has to go and, um, also, the you know we've probably got to get away from um, as far as um, from uh, owner operator type or from subcontracting type operations to get away from the piecemeal way of trying to pay people and and uh, by that I mean you know the per ton per or per whatever it, it needs to change. Like if, if your truck's travelling, for example, on on, on a, on a the rates that are often set, you know, in, in, in the part of the industry that I'm in, vary around per ton. So it's per ton to shift product from here to here. Yeah. Um, now, now that's done say on a per ton from Sydney to Melbourne. Now you've got a hell of a variance between Sydney and Melbourne. Like if it's if it's if it's from Dandenong to um, to uh, Hornsby, um, yeah. you know, that's a hell of a lot different than it is from Campbellfield to. Uh, Weatherall Park, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so all of us, you know, you need to be paid for every single part of what you do, you know. So whether that means that that has to come back to a, a cents per kilometre or something, smarter minds than me will work that out, I suppose. But, but um, you and and the, the the issue of waiting times. That's yeah, sorry, Chris. Can sorry. I back? Just wait, because it's very important. I don't want to miss it. No. The piece. So talking the piece race. Now I've got track record. I opposed piece rates 100% when I was a driver. I was on piece rates, mm. but I also worked for the largest transport company uh, around in Australia at the time, and we were very unionised, OK? I make no, no apology for that. And if there was ever any waiver out, we'd pull it back in. Not everyone has that luxury. But when we go to piece rates, and I found so many owner drivers despise piece rates, is that still the bleep? I know you, I, when I say you despise it, because of the reasons that you just mentioned, because of the distances where you may go, it doesn't one size fit all. Would you think that the majority of owner drivers like yourself would support moving oh, away from the push rates? I think I think I think majority of owner drivers will support anything that gives them a better income. Yeah, sure. But th- th- so much, so many times, they're hostage to and and frightened to um, speak out against their current. Um, work provider sort of thing, oh, you know. They, 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 they are hostage to that, and and um, um, you know some the payment terms are interesting. You know, some of our bigger market players um, in the industry that use subcontractors will. That there's no problem about getting paid on time. They'll pay you in seven days. You know, they just never pay you enough, Glenn. You know that uh, and. and um, um, you, you're playing one off against the other all the time, sort of thing, you know. So, um, sorry, Chris, I cut in on you. You yep. want to move to to payment times, I think, next or pen, uh, penalties? No, Where, yeah. The, the, one of the things I was going to move to was the um, uh, the waiting times issues. Um, if if there was a charge implemented on the amount of time you spend over than what a reasonable, and I think I heard the O'Brien fellow say they're on an hour and a half, um, you know, and, 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 you know, so whatever we can come up with on that scale, if there was a charge initiated and enforced on that, on that, um, on that time, um, I guarantee you that, that the bottlenecks that occur would stop within a week. 
when the first invoices hit the desks yeah, and people started saying, hey, you know, like bloody, uh, it, it would stop within a week, Glenn, you know. Yeah. Um, the other day I had a, a, a perfect example. I uh, unloaded in Melbourne. I had two, uh, two deliveries in Dandenong, steel out of a um, steel supplier in Newcastle through a uh, subcontracting to one of the major clients. Um, I did the first delivery at 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, went to the second delivery, which was a matter of oh, three kilometres away, four kilometres away. Pulled around the corner. I had two packs of steel to be lifted off the trailer. Pulled around the corner and there was five trucks in the street. I went inside and the reaction from the fellow was, well, you know, it's not our problem, mate. The load, night shift never did what they're doing. We're trying to load our trucks out and, you know, you're just going to have to wait. I had another commitment to, to pick up another load also in the on about an hour later and I said, mate, is there any chance I can get, no, 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 everyone's only got two packs. That's what they're all saying, you know, you'll just have to bloody wait, you know. See you later. I went outside and rang the... Um, the uh, client that we were working for, subcontracting to, and I said to him, at what stage, I was fairly, fairly wound up, I said, at what really stage weird. does somebody start paying for this? You know, I said, at what stage do we start actually charging for this? And the fellow was just that taken back that somebody had actually, you know, and I said, you know, I said, I'm just not prepared to put up with this. This is, you know, somebody's going to have to pay. If I'm stuck here till, you know, three o'clock this afternoon to get rid of these two packs of steel and somebody's going to have to start paying. And he said, oh, well, there used to be a thing a while back, but I think it all went by the wayside. I said, yeah, well, it's about time that bloody come back again. And now, the end, he said, oh, well, I'll ring the client that they work for and they'll have to ring that place and he said I can't guarantee anything's going to happen anyway within half oh I wouldn't even meet half an hour 15 minutes I suppose the fellow that I'd initially spoken to came out into the street and said to me can you back it in that bloody door there I said yeah I can mate and he said, Chris, well, well, I'd be fair to say that's a one off that's an anomaly yeah yeah but this is the point Glenn no it's an anomaly they got you in unloaded yeah 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 that, that, they got me in and un unloaded me and, and that's fine because I jumped up and down I got myself out of my problem the other Poor buggers are still Ooh, sitting there, possibly, possibly Glenn. You know, like, and, and yeah. um, you know, that, that, that's... And that was the triple whammy, Chris, that a lot of people in the transport industry don't know, don't appreciate, don't, never, never told. The triple whammy was, one, you're not going to get paid any for the extra time that you're no. paying. Number two is you could possibly lose and upset the next client and lose that job. Number three, what about the hours you've accrued waiting on your fatigue management? Exactly. That's what I said. I, I did make that point when I rang up about it. I said, this is eating into our fatigue management mm. and, and um, you know, somebody's got to be held, held responsible for it and pay for it, you know? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we've got the penalties. What else would you like to write? I mean, there's a lot. You've gone through everything. Chris and I never get I never get excited talking to you over the phone because you enlighten me again. You make me want to go back on the road for about three minutes. <laughs> um, no, it's just joking. It's not that long. <laughs> no, but, but Chris, it's most important, mate, and you raise so many issues, and we talk about ABNs and all sorts of stuff, but where I'm keen to hear from the owner-drivers and the small fleet owners is that all the knock-on effects... Eventually affect, affect you guys. Yeah, ABNs. It affects you guys. Award minimum, modern award rates of pay not being enforced because the work on the the uh, the uh, fair work ombudsman's off in fairyland. It all flows on to you. And I'd said earlier on, while these rates and these conditions are not being paid or are being paid or not being enforced, then the owner driver. The man with the with the house on the line and everything. Exactly. And I'm not knocking our employees because they've got their house on mm, the line mm, too. Mm. But then you're expected to work for this. Yeah. I nearly said shit right. I yeah. shouldn't say that. The no, crappy no. right. No. Um, <laughs> see what you've done to me? Now I'm going to get an email about my or, or, Also, Also, if we had a... Uh, if we had some... Well, for a start, you know, we get, we, we get into another area altogether and that's um, our... our Training and, and licensing mm. issues, and 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 a, and a proper having a proper um, a, a proper searching for the word um, um, a, a, a proper um, title to, to the job that we do. Oh, a proper sorry, job, yeah. sorry yeah, um, you know, yeah, 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 like, like apprenticeship, but, but uh, you know, that a, a proper qualification was the word I was oh, trying okay. to find. So that, so that to, to start, um, to be able to, that should be the starting point, A, to be able to get a job driving a, a, a proper qualification, but then B, also to have that qualification to then become an owner-operator. Um, at, at present, the uh, the only barrier to 
entry to the industry is whether the bank will give you the money or not. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I keep coming up with all the little anecdotal things that we do during the week, but l last night was a typical case where um, I uh, crossed paths with a fellow who owned his own truck at the steel mill in Newcastle where I was loading um, and who uh, is only a recent um, ent entry to the industry. Um, he uh, was a chap probably, you know, 30 to 40 years of age um, and from one of the um, subcontinental countries. He was a, uh, you know, whether he was Indian, Sri Lankan or I, I'm not real sure. Hell of a nice bloke. Um, but it become fairly obvious in talking to him that, that he was very, very new and very inexperienced at what he was doing. Um, we, he got, got his load on and managed to secure it in a reasonable sort of a fashion. Then we had to go down to the uh, tarping area of the, what we're fairly dinosaurs. We actually use tarps and all that sort of so stuff. Yeah, they So, so that was okay. And he'd been, been down there sort of half an hour before I got there. And when I went down there, I. I was in a hurry to get everything that I had to get done to get back here today. Anyhow, I uh, I looked at the way he was going about it, and it was all totally wrong. He was pulling the sides of his tarp down before the ends, just little things that, that, that you know that we all have learned over the years that, that you know have been around. And I thought to myself, I really should go and give this fellow a hand here, but but I really am pressed for time, and I probably you know. And I watched. And out of the corner of my eyes, I was doing mine, and, and he got to the end stage where he had the tarp hanging over the end of his gates and then decided that that wasn't going to work so he's pulled it down and he was woo mate woo 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 <laughs> and I said just pull it he said it's going to be a gap though it won't be long enough I said if we pull it down and envelope it properly it, it will be you know and anyhow he said oh you must be very experienced I've never seen this done before you know and I said yeah well, you know, I've done it once or twice anyway the, the, I, I, out of frustration I said to him mate didn't anybody show you didn't anybody train you or tell you and he said, no, he said, I did ask the, the company that, you know, we're working for if they could, he, that I hadn't done this before and could they, and they said, just ask the local driver that's in there loading, he'll show you. He said, no, I it asked, worked. no, it not, not me, oh. it was another, I asked okay. their local driver who was in there and he said, all he said to me was, I just tied the thing down and, you know, and anyhow, um, I, I just sort of um, got him going in the right fashion anyway without spending too much time and afterwards I got a, an attack of the guilts because I thought geez when I was a young bloke there was probably some old bloke that spent an hour or so right. with, with me buddy uh, and, and showed me what to do you know and buddy uh, and I've left this bloke to his own devices and I thought what is it about what we do now that you know why didn't I you know and I'm feeling guilty about you know but I, I thought in, that in the old days when we were doing that the old bloke that helped me didn't have to contend with a camera out the road that was going to record him going underneath it. He could fiddle his logbook a little bit to the evening if he got caught on it and it was going to cost him 50 bucks or something. Um, you know, and I probably bought him a beer after we did that and, and, and left anyway sort of thing. You know, the industry now just doesn't, isn't able to cater for that. But if, if the, if the industry's still going to butcher people by sending them in to do that without the proper training and, and you know, then that reflects back on everything else as well. Well, Chris, let's look down this line because um, every one of our witnesses so far today, and I'm sure there will be a common theme here, uh, me also, we all came because we learned it from our old man or our uncle mm. or our boys are in it or our girls are in it. And um, that's what drives me still, too, because there's the third generation of the stills in long-distance driving. You've got a young bloke in it. Yep. So you, like me, are a long-distance truck driver. You're the son of a long-distance truck driver. And, my God, you're the father of a long-distance truck driver or a truck driver. So what do you think it holds for the next generation? Your boy and, and generations on, if we continue on the trajectory we're on, where we are price takers... We have no protection. We have the living daylights kicked out of us by regulation when we step over the line or go over a white line or spell something wrong. Is this sustainable? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, uh, no, it's, no, it's not sustainable at all. I, uh, I worry about him a lot because he, um, he uh, tends to take a lot of, uh, um, a lot of these things to, to heart. He's become terribly frustrated about the amount of time that, um, like he's, he's, working week and and he, he you know look we all accept that that, that it is 
what it is when we come into it, we come into it with our eyes wide open, you know, like nobody's <laughs> pulled the wool over anyone's eyes. But um, his young fellow lives on him, um, still lives on his own, does his own washing and everything of a weekend, you know. So he got a pretty, pretty big, uh, pretty big week by the time he spends the week up and down. And again, the frustration of you know, you only need something to hold you up here that leads into holding you up there, that leads in, and, and all of a sudden it's Saturday lunchtime before you're home, and Sunday, you know, almost like that old... Um, Jack Thompson movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one thing that I'll, I'll give you that, that you know, he, he's aware that I came in here, and one thing he said to me before he came in here, and I'll, <laughs> I'll give you this one for what it's worth. Um, Brace ourselves. He, right? Yeah, yeah, he said to me, um, he said, do you remember the Break and Rant movie? I said, yeah. He said, well... You just let Glenn and you blokes that, that are given evidence. He said, make sure. He said, uh, um, you know, the break and rant movie. He said, uh, shoot straight, you bastards. Don't muck this up, you know. Like, buddy, and uh, for his sake, at least, that's what I'm trying to do, sort of thing, you know. Absolutely. And this is where I'm, I'm trying to lead to, Chris. And, 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 you know, we've been in an industry where you've got to tough it out and, you know, very blokey and we get all that sort of stuff. And, yep, fine. And But, you know... I know there's a lot uh, of uh, attention, and quite rightfully so, around the nation, and I've had this conversation, and Gordo and I were talking about it last night, you know, where it's coming to the forefront, the pressures upon our fly-in, fly-out um, workers, and there's divorces, and there's mental health issues, and there's all sorts of things being away from home. And that is very important. But our truckies have been living with this from day one, too. And, uh, and, and not to diminish the argument, not, not at all. But I think we have to pay far more attention to uh, the lifestyle of our truckies, yes, most definitely. It's a lifestyle that we all love. We all chose to do it, and none of us were forced into it, I think. But now the impost upon us is becoming so great. Would it be unreasonable of me to say, stop? Governments of all persuasions have been very good at putting their hands into the pockets of the transport operators and workers and drivers and all that over the years. But now there needs to be some... Um, not interference, but some support. Yeah. And I think that's all. I'm, I'm picking that out very clearly. I mean, Chris, we could shut our eyes and you and I could write the same, mm. the, 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 the same um, 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 submission. So would it be unfair for us to say, hang on, now we need some support? No, no, we do, Glenn. Mm. We, we, mm. We, need, we need support um, just, just to, you know, in all levels. And... and, and and the corporates need as much support as well. I go, like, I, don't, I don't, don't, you know, yep. uh, deny that for a moment, you know. Mm. Um, and and um, it, it, it needs support all the way through. But it, 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 and again, I go back to the thing where you need the support from the agencies that are already there, the fair, fair work on budsmen, uh, whether it's a small business. Uh, um, there's also a small business on budsmen. Um, all those sort of uh, things need to support us. Um, to just get a fair outcome and, and, and it, it, it can be done incrementally, you know, and, and, and I'm just so frustrated that, that um, uh, events, without wanting to get in, to no, no. events from, from... I think you should, no, Chris, I think you, yeah, we want to move forward. Yeah, events, events so from three years ago... Yep. Um, we it, 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 it turned into a into a a mess, but the the, the intent of, of what was went on then, I think the in, intent was honourable, and it and it got mucked up by bureaucrats and a whole heap other other things. But we walked away with nothing, and 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 we've wasted three bloody years. You know, we're like we haven't even got to the stage now of, of not even you know we're still arguing about payment terms. You know, like all of those sort of things mm. were things that could have been at least. You know, and, and the associations, I think, failed us in a lot of ways because there was a big void there afterwards. Like, it, 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 we, we didn't have anything. There was no replacement of, of, of uh, anything or no move forward. It was just because they'd killed off what they were worried about, then there was the, the, that, that was that would solve all the problems. So it didn't solve anything. All it did was, was leave us open to the same manipulation and, and unscrupulous mm. things that have been going on for, you know, and here we are three years down, down the track still doing the same sort of thing, you know? And this is where I've been very keen to to work with industry, the 
to once again highlight, and you know my line, Chris, you've heard it a number of times, there was far more that unites us than the Yeah, yeah exactly. And so Senator Rennick, it was the abolition of the RSRT, warts and all, and there is no hiding the fact it split the industry and was it very poorly presented and handled? Yes, of course, there was some real bogeys in it. Was the baby thrown out the bathwater? Chris, I'll leave you to answer that. Yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've said all along that that was the case, Glenn, yes, that we, yes. um, that we, we, we just, um, and, and the, the problem is when you leave a void like that, mm. um, if you're not careful, like it, it, it's, it's like ripping out a plant, you know, if you rip, rip out something and don't replace it with something, bloody, mm. uh, be careful of what's going to grow there, you know, because it'll, you'll finish up with a weed that you don't want at all, you know, and, and that's where we were, we were pretty, you know, one of our major associations I hold to account for it. I'm, I hold that road to account for it. Uh, I, I think they've held us dismally by not providing any leadership for any uh, for any um, uh, alternative. And, and you know, for certain that, that, that you know, if, if you wanted to get rid of the bogies out of the RSRT thing, that's fine. But to leave us with absolutely nothing to move on with was was just a failure. You know. I think I might just um, um, come in there as well uh, and, and just throw my two bobs worth in. The beauty of this, I'm one of those half full glass guys, you know, <clears throat> and if we dwell on the past too long, you know, we yeah. just go crazy. But I think the most important thing that's come out of the Transport Industry Standard Forum is, which Chris, you have been very active in, but uh, to the defence of Matt Road, so have they. Oh, exactly. And I must yeah, say, yeah, no. and, and I just want to clear this, look, Warren and Scott will talk for Matt Roads mm. and the members, but we've now got people on board supporting and demanding the Senate inquiry, which is a great thing because it was the associations and other people that went now, and I'm not going to put words in their mouth, but I think I can safely run the line of, well, <clears throat> what do we do next? Because um, what have we left? And, and look, you're spot on. I'm, I'm and I'm going to get attacked again by the eight I'm, I'm boyed, people, but there you go. I'm buoyed a little bit recently by Nat Road that they have at least to my, you know, from unless I'm wrong and reading it wrong, um, that, that they at least seem to have dropped their opposition to that they were used to run a line constantly that that, um, that that money had no effect on safety. Now they seem to at least drop that rhetoric at least, you know, whether they still believe it or not, I don't know, but, but at least the rhetoric has dropped off on that and there's no opposition now from, um, from them apparently to um, to, you know, and I'm, and I'm bored and happy that that's the, the case, you know. And the, and the most important thing is the industry has come together and driving this this, in, this inquiry. So, so Chris, look, I really do want you to, to continue and get things out, but I'll probably pose this for you. And look, as, oh, as um, childish it may seem, I don't mean it that way. If you were the minister, mate... And I'm seriously, because I'm dead set serious. We want to take, we want to develop the best possible recommendation that we can take to government and say, guess what? This is not Sterl making this up. This is the industry speaking as one. But what needs to be done, mate? What, what, what should we be starting to address first? Because we can talk in silos and we can talk about every single bit of the transport industry that's important. And there are so many of them. But what is the overarching thing we need to fix first? <sighs> I, I would, I, I heard you pose that question to the O'Brien fellas and I'm sort of been struggling with, um, you know, how I was going to come at it when you threw that at me. Um, I think you're probably going to start from the absolute ground and that's how new drivers come through. Give them a qualification. If we started with that from the very ground down, give them a qualification so that then, um, over a period of time that they're a qualified driver, they can then expect to be paid and remunerated as a, and valued for the qualification that they've got. Um, I think can we I all, the, almost can need... The, sorry, can I be the devil's advocate? Yep. I'm Chris and then I'll come back to you. Yep. And we're going to have all the qualifications in the world, but unless we've got some arm of, hang on, if you're not doing the right thing... This needs to be fixed because of what we have realised that we'll have all the demands of qualifications and safety and Euro 6 engines and give me another extra two feet on your trailer and give me another trailer and all we've managed to do over the years is say to the client base, how much more cheap freight can we carry for you or how much more freight can we carry you for nothing? Mm. So sorry, Chris, I want to address that, then move on, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, uh, I, I, uh, I understand that, Glenn, but um, the... Yeah, the, 
Well, then we have to move into our agencies, as we've spoken before about the Fair Work Ombudsman, um, and and then maybe the uh, the Small Business Ombudsman. You know, having a having a control of uh, rates. I've, I've often also thought that um, perhaps the NHVR has a place to play in all of this, as far as the uh, the um, um, cop on the beat. Yeah, the cop on the beat, and, and getting back to Hugh's thing with the uh, chain of economic responsibility, that, that um, uh, one of the first places that, when, when we have a chain of responsibility type thing in our industry, one of the first, the first place it'll start is on the road, where the driver will get, get interviewed and, and that ring, rings off alarm bells. One of the first ways that, if they were to, um, if there was some way of ascertaining straight away what, in, in, in an interception, what the driver was being paid and what what the the truck was working for, you could you chain a responsibility thing could go the other way. That that you know, if if the drivers weren't properly paid, the the, the loads being properly paid, and the uh, you know uh, any waiting times being properly accounted for, and if that was documented in the truck, the roadside authority could say, ah, oh, this one's fine, you know, get him going, you know. When they find someone who's not being paid properly. You know, then they can sort of say, "Hang on, this is gonna, there's going to be other things going on here." You know, like what else is is, is at fault here? So, um, look, <laughs> it's a tough one. Uh, no, I understand, Chris. It is because we, when we sit down in a cool day of light, crikey, we could keep going all the way yeah. from truck bays to payments to waiting times to getting paid we, in seven days or cash on delivery we, or thirty days or what. You know, we can we, keep going. We've probably got to make our our industry just a more attractive place for quality people to be. Um, you know, the, 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 um, we need a better quality of, and, and the only way you're going to attract that quality is A, by having a qualification, B, by re remunerating them properly, um, and, and, um, just, just try and attract a better type person through the, and, and, but you can only do that if you, the industry is actually attractive in, in ways to them, and, Again, we've probably got to deal with the fact that the young generation coming through, because you know all us old blokes are going to be gone fairly shortly. Um, retired, and, retired. And, yeah, and and to keep them, to, to keep them, um, to to attract the people we we need in the industry, they're going to need also a, a lifestyle. Like we were always too prepared to work too hard for not enough, and, and that's our own fault, and we've, we've, we've suffered all that. But the, the sort of people that we need to attract to make this industry go further and continue on and be safe and be viable and all that sort of... You need the quality people, but they need... You know, we've, we've got to address the whole thing, you know, so mm -hmm. qualification, their remuneration, a, a, a lifestyle, you know, like it, it's probably beyond... I, 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 as well as being a, a, an owner-operator, we've also at times employed people and as a small employer and I had one very good worker a uh, few years ago who uh, just um, who resigned just because he was uh, leaving the area and um, when we we're having a few beers and when he finished up you know and we we're just talking he said I've really enjoyed the job it's been terrific you know and you've been good to work with um, he said there's only one thing wrong he said um, geez I would have liked a weekend off now and then you know and I sort of thought you yeah, had well, you had every weekend off, you know, and 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 because I thought that you know getting home Saturday and leaving Sunday, you had the weekend off, you know, and he said, <laughs> I mean, like finish Friday and start Monday, you know, and and and, uh, um, and so the newer generation is going to want that. When the quality, the type of quality people we need to make this industry what it what it needs to be, they're going to want that. So and and again, the, then then. One thing leads to another, leads to another. For for that, then um, there's a there's a cost involved with that. So uh, we can't keep flogging the same dead horse all the time. We've got you know, and, we, and it's always a willing horse that'll get the most whip, you know. So um, until we can, you know, just get our heads as an industry around just making the whole thing more attractive to, to those sort of people, um, if we want our industry to be sustainable, to be safe, and 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 again, that that's all 
part of the quality of the people that we can, can attract to it. It's a very good point you raise, Chris, because I know everyone in this room, mate, we all got home on Christmas Eve and we all pulled out Boxing Day. Yeah, yeah. And we all got home Friday night, the truck was washed, serviced, Saturday, fueled, boom, gone again, and we took it as normal. Hmm. There's nothing normal about that. <laughs> it was normal for us. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're right. Uh, one of the biggest problems I have, Chris, is, and look, I'm, I'm with you all the way on, on attracting young people, women into our industry, um, but the, and I'd be keen to hear, because we can't learn at the hips of our dads anymore, legally, okay, right, um, how do we say to kids at 15, 16, how would you like to be in the trucking industry? You can either be a long distance truck driver, you can be a metro truck driver, you can be a forky, you could be sales admin, you could be receivable staff, you could be any single thing you want, but don't come back to us till you've got your licences. And we expect them to come back when they're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. How do we target those younger ones, mate? Yeah, um... Or what well, should we be doing in the schools? Well, well, well we've, we've got to target them and, uh, again, give them, give them a, 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 something of a qualification, something to aim to. Um, I can also see the problems here with that. Like, uh, over the years, you know, in, in reality, like, like you've said, the, the, the people who, the best, the current best people in the industry are people who've learned because they've learned up there through their family or, mm. or, 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 in a, or in a, an accomplice of some sort that, that they've learned from the ground roots, ground up. Now, all sorts of things have happened since then. We've got, you know, um, legislation, um, oh, yes, we China, uh, not yeah. China responsibility, but the uh, workplace, you know, job site safety and all those sort of things that prevent that sort of thing from being able to happen anymore. Um, to, to make them, um, to make it more uh, attractive um, for, for those sort of, and, and how to get those sort of people in. Um, yeah, we, we we need to get them early. Um, and I've, I've got a thing where I just wonder, you know, if, if the people that are prepared, if if, if you if, to get our corporates. To be prepared to train these people, it does come at a cost. Yes. So right. whether we can whether we can then have some sort of indenture or or um, or a hex type thing, so that the employer who's prepared to spend the money on on the uh, on the juniors to bring them through is then protected a little bit because. So often, you know, the, the the reticence to train people is because, and I think I heard the O'Brien people mention it, that, that, you know, you put the effort into training them and then somebody comes along and poaches them, you know. And and I've sort of said before that, you know, that I often um, read the local newspaper here on a Saturday morning and uh, the job's vacant is, is nothing more than a poaching exercise, you know. Like the, all the local transport companies throw, a, uh, throw an ad in and, and all they're looking for is the bloke who comes home Saturday morning, frustrated with the week that he's had with the uh, with his current employer, who who might ring up and um, you know, and it, and it just goes around and around and around, you know. But if there was some sort of uh, encouragement for the for the uh, corporate type people who can who can put the um, the uh, money into into doing the training and doing it properly with a proper proper scheme, if it was some proper type scheme. Um, and then if they were at least protected by some sort of an indenture or hex scheme that, 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 uh, they could retain that employee somehow or other for the, for a, for a period where that they could re regain their, uh, their uh, investment in him, the, uh, him or her, then, um, then that, that might help. I think I'm wrapping up on that then, Chris. I think there's a massive desire coming out of the Transport Industry Standard Forums, all the employers I talk to, everyone's keen to do it, but I think now we've got to get down to the nutty bit and just, to let you know there has been conversations now with the group that was chosen from there to speak with Minister Cash and she was very engaging but uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that we can uh, not only develop, I'd love to see a training an apprenticeship but let's, let's just hope we've got it recognised on the national psyche and there's some government money around there to assist mm -hmm. Chris I'm going to, I hate to say this one I'm going to have to bid you farewell, now you're going to jump in the truck and now head where? Home Home. <laughs> we better get you home. Chris, is there one last thing you'd like to blow past us, mate, before we say goodbye? No, I just, just want to uh, express uh, my appreciation that, that you know, I, <laughs> I've uh, uh, very uh, surprised, I'm very pleasantly surprised that this has been able to happen. And, um, and I just want to thank everyone involved for, uh, for allowing it to happen, and thanks very much. Thanks, Chris, and it couldn't happen without the support of the industry, mate. So travel safe.